Deep Conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. Hi and welcome or welcome back to Think About It, a podcast about big ideas and great books. We are definitely in a period right now where we want some big ideas. The COVID-19 pandemic has engulfed the world and most of you are probably listening if you're lucky from home. My heart goes out and I want to send a word of support and love to all of those who can't stay home, who have to work, especially medical personnel, anybody in a high risk group, and those of you who have to just be out there to support yourselves. This is a very serious thing for many people and I hope everyone will be well. Today's conversation is with Professor Anne Stoller of the New School in New York City about the philosopher Michel Foucault. Foucault is a French philosopher who died in 1984 and is known mostly as a historian of ideas. He is the author of several books. Some of them have proven incredibly relevant more recently. And those books are, among others, The History of Madness, The Birth of the Clinic, The Order of Things, and The Archaeology of Knowledge. Other books are Discipline and Punish and The History of Sexuality. Foucault was interested how the concepts by which we make sense of the world are historically contingent, meaning how those concepts are shaped by the times in which we live and how concepts, including words such as the truth or knowledge, normal, healthy, good, orderly, correct, etc., sane, are actually defined in ways that allow us to make distinctions between ourselves and others, for example. So in the history of madness, he traced how the mad have been defined in different ways in different societies and throughout time. Most of his emphasis was on Western society, on European society, because it has such an impact on the world. Anne Stoller, who is professor of history and anthropology at the New School, is the author of several books, among them books on Foucault, that have investigated how to think with Foucault rather than just about him. The titles of her books include Race and the Education of Desire, Foucault's History of Sexuality and the Colonial Order of Things, Along the Archival Grain, Epistemic Anxieties and Colonial Common Sense, and Haunted by Empire, Geographies of Intimacy in North American History. Foucault asked some basic questions. What we desire and what we love, is that innate to us, natural, or is it historically contingent, shaped by the culture and background in which we are raised? What we think is normal and accept as such, and how we operate then, is that something that is shifting according to the society in which this term is produced? I sat down with Anne in the fall of 2019. Things have changed very quickly, but a reminder that this podcast is not really a podcast about books. It's a podcast that is trying to show how we think and can think with books, with other authors, how those authors can be activated to allow us to make sense of our condition and situation in the world. All the books I talk about on this this podcast here are books that have transformed paradigms of knowledge, of ways of making sense of the world, even of existence. So Foucault is one of those writers as a historian of knowledge, as a philosopher, who's upended certain assumptions about how we even make sense of the truth of knowledge, etc. So enjoy this episode, and I hope everybody is well. This one is with Professor Anne Stoller at the New School about the philosopher Michel Foucault. And I'm really happy to have you here. First of all, uh, thank you for coming on Think About It today. I'm, I'm so delighted. It's just sort of an honor to get to talk about someone who's been so, so deeply critical in terms of my own work, right? For almost really 30 years. And you're an anthropologist, well, or <laughs> well, you know, I was trained at Columbia as an anthropologist, supposedly. Yeah. But the first thing I ever did at Columbia was to write an historical okay. Um, okay. dissertation, and that's sort of I've always been between history and anthropology. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The move to the New School was really to allow that part of philosophy to flourish, which has always been so crucial to me. Which is maybe where Foucault, who's not really classifiable. And as... won't classify, never would classify himself. Right. Every time he said, are you a philosopher? Right. He said, no, are you an historian? No. That's right. And, That's and right. I, I take that absolutely, it's so resonant for me. 
because but tell me a little bit about what resonated with you when you first oh. encountered this, because you were doing work, sort of critical work on archives and how things are Not when I encountered, when I first encountered Foucault, I was living in Paris, and very foolishly I was attending Bourdieu's lectures and Levi Strauss, and not Foucault's, and I was there in 79, 80, 81. It wasn't yeah. bad, though. You were yeah, a good year at Levi Strauss, so you were at a pretty so, high level already. Yeah, <laughs> so I was, well, we were actually in Paris because my partner um, was invited by Levi Strauss to Paris. Oh, really? And we, I went kicking and screaming because I wanted to be near the colonial archives, the Dutch colonial archives, so I had a six hour train ride. But I first encountered Foucault at the same time I encountered Said. Okay. Which was, you know, Said's book came out in 78, and Foucault's... This is Orientalism. The, Orientalism, yeah. and the History of Sexuality is 1980, and there okay. I was writing my dissertation on the ways in which an entire multinational set of corporations, Unero, Goodyear, these plantations that have been in Indonesia over 100 years, um, shape so much of their labor policies through the control of gender relations, sexuality, who had access to which woman, how wages a woman. So for me, the, the, the line of Foucault's that has stuck with me so much of my, my work is sexuality is a dense transfer point of power. Hmm. And that, what that means, how one understands what it means to say something is a transfer point of power, has, has kept me going for a really long time because it's not clear what you actually mean by that. Do you mean it passes through sexuality, but it's not about it? You mean it is transformed through sexuality in some way, that power is actually congealed around sexuality? So for many years, my work has sort of turned on those spaces of trying to under some, understand something about what a transfer point meant, meant, and that's what race and the education of desire so was in some sense about. And the education of desire is you're looking at these colonial... So the education right. of desire for me still remains sort of crucial to my teaching. The notion that people are made into subjects of particular kinds, they're constituted as subjects who don't have prior desires, but those desires are managed they're enhanced, they're animated, they're cut off. And the ways in which the distribution of those desires operates actually sets out, you can see the racial topography of a colonial system. Whom, who's allowed what desires, towards whom, when and where? What are the effects of those desires? Right. Is that child a product of that desire, legitimate or not? Race and sexuality were just like, for me, like. It wasn't even a question way before intersectionality, even like was, But it's know. interesting when I read your book, it yeah. seems obvious now, but yeah. if, you, if, I, if you started me out and saying, how would the Dutch colonial rule organize labor in the late 19th century in Dutch colonies, I wouldn't think sexuality and would desire anything, would be anything to even talk about. I say, well, you got to behave and you got to come to work and you got to live like this. But the fact that you unearthed this that there's even attention paid to how people... Oh, extraordinarily. You know, exp and what you said, that sexuality is as much a creation of these codes as it is this original primal expression that we have. This well, thing. one of the things that you can see so clearly if you look at the housekeeping manuals for white women is how carefully it was orchestrated whether the child could be how close to the nursemaid or how far from her, what sorts of desires were activated mm. by the senses, by smell, mm. by touch, mm. by breast milk, by a range of things. They were not allowed to um, nurse um, children in, at that time. I've written an, an awful lot about finding these different levels at which the education of desire was sort of thought about worried about, concerned, because part of the fear was the desire would be to kill the father, which okay. would be the Dutch colonial. Okay. okay. So that desire was there almost throughout, through, throughout every single stage. And when you use the word desire there, and you say educating desire, there's another understanding that desire is mm -hmm. primal, innate, something I want to figure out about myself, right? Yeah. There's a bit of the kind of 
layman's, laywoman's right. right. Freudian idea. Well, it's funny, at the end of the education desire, yeah. say, you know, right. basically Foucault uses the word desire, but never tells us what he means. Right, right. Right? I try to make it actually very empirical in a way, yeah. and very grounded, and very, f not flat, but try to understand why they were so worried that a child would worry about, why they'd worry about a child sitting on their haunches rather than on a chair. Okay. Why a child would want to speak Javanese rather than Dutch. To what extent the desire to understand something about where, what this colony was, was something that it was a danger. So, the, so it, it, it wasn't control of desire. Right. It was a concern and a knowledge that they couldn't control it. Okay. And it wasn't just with children, it was with the entire European community. But it was also a desire to be white. You should want to be white. So right. that's what you mean by the education. It goes in two ways. It goes it's, into it's every way. It's both restrictive, also enabling. Absolutely. Say so you should want this. You should want this. And the other extraordinary assumption is that people who are not white want it. Hmm. it was, it's assumed yeah, okay. that is what the colonial okay. governance is right. kind of based upon. That what they want to do is be who we are, not have what we are. Right? A Siang Nagai in a beautiful book on an ugly desires, right? It's that difference between be someone else, be what they are, or have what they have. Okay. Not to be white, but to have it. And that distinction hmm. was really rarely made. So the assumption of most colonial systems was that everybody, that's what they wanted. If they could get there, that's what they wanted. And we know from black history and black culture, that's not even close to the kids. If right? you... You just said you sort of tried to write the book in a kind of flat way, very detail-oriented, very much empirical, which is very close to what Foucault did in all of his works. Absolutely. Very, That's what I took from him. That's so right. There's an enormous amount of detail, and then Foucault, yeah. as you said, shies away at just about every moment from giving a synthetic overview and saying, this is what power is, this is what this exactly. subject, this is what it is. He said, I've, I've, not interested. I'm only interested yeah. how these terms work within, within relation of one another. Yeah. So you, when you did your book... Uh, well, I mean, oh, so that's, it, 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 uh, the book where that really comes out, and I think it's the strongest book I have, is not The Race, the Education, or Desire, but the one along the archival brain. Because yeah. that's where Foucault led me. He led me to look at the gray spaces of documents, of the ways in which the closer you are to the touch of a document, to the feel of a document, the more it's possible to understand something about about the rough ground, as Wittgenstein would put it, of life. And not the smooth, easy coherence of here's the whites and here's the people who aren't white, and here's the colonized and here are the con but a, an enormous amount of sort of epistemic anxiety about who is what and how are we ever gonna secure this. And it's Foucault who, I mean, I don't even teach with the word theory. I don't use the word theory. I went did the Cornell theory camp, but... Um, we all lived through our own versions all, of that camp. <laughs> but I don't, I actually don't allow my students to use the word theory. I said, look, if you want to talk about something, talk about concepts. Talk about the way you use concepts. Think about concept work. So my last book, Under Rest, is really a book about right. concept work. And it's about not taking a concept as authorization, which is so much done with Foucault. I mean, everything's biopolitics and everything's about sexuality. But actually, that kind of labor that Foucault gives to a concept is, was, I think that's probably one of the things that's, that's held me the longest and continues every single day in what I do now. And say something more about what does this concept work? Sort of, well, it's not just to say, let's use this concept in many different circumstances or apply it in many it, different cases. Well, one of the beautiful things, it's, if we could take this from Derrida, it's to understand something about the scene of its production, how concepts are conceived, the spaces in which they operate, the spaces in which, I mean, one of the things Foucault says over and over again, he says, I want to bring back to history its fragility. Hmm. He uses the word fragile a lot mm. in an enormous number of the, um, in the archaeology of knowledge, but also in the lectures. There's a kind of force and fragility he's constantly trying to get at, not the certitude 
of knowing, which we don't even need to go to teleology, but just the certitude of knowing who's a good guy and who's a bad guy, which is why you see Nietzsche so powerful in his work, and it became so powerful in my own, because everything for me, in a way, became, how do you get, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tumbling over myself because it's so much um, still a part of me. Uh, and I'm going to keep you for a moment with this. He doesn't allow you to sort of settle well, uh, on a concept and say, this is, we know this was established, right. but now we can use it as a stable reference. He said, it's still he, state, yeah. The word he uses in the archaeology of knowledge is provisional. He said, I know some of you are going to be annoyed with how I use this, but let us say provisionally. I have to use concepts, we all do. But then I want to see if I can work with them. So he says, right in the beginning of archaeology, he says, um, we can't do work with words like influence. All they do, words like legacy, all they do is cover over mm -hmm. dispersions. Mm -hmm. How do we find a way, and genealogy is the way in which mm -hmm. he actually does it, how do we find a way to think otherwise? It's, it's this whole notion of penser autrement. But even in this kind of, but, when it said, let's say, influence covered over something, he right. doesn't just mean it covered over the blind spots, omissions, and absences. No. It's actually something else, right? It's not just right. a history to write the history of the forgotten. Because it, it there's a kind of simple way to say, oh, you're the, absolutely the mad right. men, the, the no, person who's penalized, you know, no, the, sexually deviant. He said, right. it's not a history of the forgotten, it's something else. And it's, it's interesting you should put it that way, because that's how it's been sort of reduced to, what it's been reduced Which to. Which would be a productive Which, thing, I guess. I right? guess, and it's sort of a functionalist argument, right? But, There's functions for this, and then we're going to function for that. And, and he then, would have a problem because he would say, you're just substituting another that's right. closed concept and say, that's now right. the madman that's stands right. for. And he says, no, the madman doesn't stand for anything, but plays a role in how we think of how discourse operates. So there's a beautiful way in which Adorno, for me, really, you know, Foucault said, if only I'd known about the Frankfurt School when he was younger. He is so beautiful. <laughs> he said, I mean, I don't know how I didn't know about it, but nobody what did he taught know? it. You know, and what did he know? Althusser and Hegel? Very, so. very close to Althusser. I mean, he was a student of Althusser. <laughs> right. um, but Adorno has this wonderful notion about the concept that it's it's always a surfeit. There's never the possibility that everything can be included in it. And so for me, very close to Foucault, it's a notion of what is it that spills outside its edges? Mm -hmm. what, is the, what are the, the understandings that can't be totally subsumed within that concept itself? And what kind of leverage and friction and... and traction in a way we can get from working on the edges of those concepts that seem to already be so, so coherent mm -hmm. and so secure. So some of those for me have been white, just have been colony and colonizer, have been colony itself, which led me to do a lot of new work around camps and colonies and the ways in which those two terms were substitutable mm -hmm. for each other historically, but also the transformation in the use of those concepts. What Foucault did is he didn't ever hold it tight to a concept. He's constantly kind of um, opportunistic and opening to new kinds of spaces. And so I've never found this parochial kind of, if I'm Foucaultian, I'm Foucaultian, or if I'm Marx, I'm Marx. Right. Anything of that. It's in, in, if, if anything, it's a defiance. It's an irreverence for that kind of thing that I really love. And well, you, you say you use a reflective insolence in your love book. Love that term. Which is kind, of, is kind of insolent also toward the idea of mastery. It's, that Foucault is the paradigm that allows us to now understand history in the right way. Absolutely. But no, it's, it, it, it's and he does two things. He says these That's concepts right. change through time. That's right. But they're already, as you said, blurry at the moment when they're deployed. Exactly. So and you have to look at this, both. It's absolutely. not just that it changes no, over time. Not only that it changes, but its very constitution is, it, he uses the word um, vibrant, mm -hmm. that they're active. So when I wrote the Along the Archival Grain book, the first chapter is called The Pulse. He uses pulsating. Okay. And I didn't even alive. notice it, that <laughs> I had taken it. Right. I mean, I didn't even know I did it, the pulse of the archive. Right. Because the ways in which we've thought of archives is that all the excitement and passion is in, in us, not in the archive okay, itself. Right. So it's Le Goût de l'Archive of yeah, Arlette yeah. Farge, whose work I adore and who worked with Foucault. 
But I wasn't trying to get at my desire in the archive. I was trying to get at the movement, the ways in which Foucault shows us movement within language, movement within, within the way in which a vocabulary is deployed, the ways in which it's, it, it's, it's topography, it's how it, how it shifts in time. Right. And the book that he's probably most known for is the one on madness. Than the Which has never been that important for me. Right, it's interesting. And in Discipline and Punish, but all of them say they're movements in terms of all these different categories and concepts do a lot of work in their time, and we actually reduce them to just, we know what this means, we know what this means. And he said, mm -hmm. the interesting thing is they were created to stop us from asking That's what exactly they mean. Right. They just sort of stopped their thinking. And, right. and so he activates these... And I always that's find a, that's the word that I think of with him is, is, is a sort of an animation activation. Right. I mean, he said right? it pulsates. Also, some of the scenes mm -hmm. he writes about, they're very right. literary. They're dramatic. Well, <laughs> if there is a, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if it's a gambit. I think you know, it, there is concepts have a, are the poetry of philosophy, yeah. and <laughs> and it's really in some ways. Foucault takes that really very yeah. much avant la lettre and does it yeah. all the time. There is a poésie yeah. in his conceptual repertoire and the ways in which the imagery of his concepts, I mean, metaphor, sort of conceptual metaphor, I think of is really sort of powerful, whether it be the carceral archipelago, right? There's so many different forms in which he's, he plays with it holds on to it for a while. I mean, he never returns to the language of archaeology. Right, right. It's so dead. But it's you have so to have an ear for the poetry. And when you said there's a conceptual metaphor, in your own work, I mean, I, you have an ear, and when you that. read things in the archive and you think, this is a novel, or That's let's right. say what we usually categorize as metaphorical, fictional, sort of on the side of that type Absolutely. of language. And Foucault does the same thing. Sometimes he gives you something, says, I took this from an archive. And you think, this is what the archive contained? Right. Exactly. Because you think the archive is a That's bunch of exactly. dusty drawers or CD-ROMs or chips or whatever. And you said, this is what it no, contains. Richard, that's so but, true. But uh, how do you get somebody to list to have the ear for that? Because I feel Foucault wants to constantly remind us we can listen to this archive. But we Absolutely. tend to actually want to just close it because it's the past and it doesn't touch us. We've moved beyond it. I mean, his first gestures, the idea that we've moved beyond these things and progressed. Mm. I think what's missing then is this, this capacity to listen to what has been. That's so interesting you should put it that way because the reason I name the book along the archival grain, with the grain, with the feel of it, with its roughness rather than against it, is because most of postcolonial scholarship has always meant, we've got to read against the grain. Walter Benjamin said we have to, we have to resist. We have to show resistance and show where the resistance I said, but how can you possibly write history against the grain unless you understand what along the grain of governance and power were? What constituted some of the, the positives, the, the really radical forms of managing a world that they only partly could control. So for me, starting with the kind of politically correct space of against right. was to miss some of the multiple logics. And that's what Foucault also says. It's not one logic. It's not that discipline, right. discipline replaced, biopower replaces discipline. I mean, one of the things he says that, that really just always floored me is that these are, are almost folded into each other. Mm -hmm. So I came up with this kind of, in a dress book, way of thinking that the way in which Foucault thinks and the way in which history operates is through recursion. Mm -hmm. It's through a recursive folding, something Deleuze looked at the fold. Mm -hmm. So when it folds again on something, it doesn't fold with the same plane visible. Mm -hmm. History mm -hmm. keeps folding mm -hmm. in upon mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. The elements are there, many of them, colonialisms, but they're not going to look the same, nor the same surfaces going to be as important, as volatile, as violent as they were at other times. So what you see, it's, it's, it's almost a double helix of right. movement. The images are 
are so important because otherwise you come up with this kind of linear. But I like mm. it also because it's what you're saying of folding, it's positive and negative. That's because right. That's he right. says so, power so, is not this oppressive force above us. He said it mm. constitutes us. It constitutes and, us and it's so productive. In a different way. That's productive. That means we like it. We yeah. need it. We want it. We yeah. are it. That's we right. don't exist without it. We yeah. actually don't exist prior to it in Green and Brownson. Yeah. So when the, the grain... When people want to resist the grain, they right. think, I don't want to participate in that kind of history writing. And he would say, that's all we have. We are not constituted outside. So also right. against the grain means I find the position that goes against this yeah. dispositive or paradigm. And Foucault yeah. said, what outside is there? Exactly. So exactly. in some ways, I think that's been really animating for your work. Totally. But I think some people feel, well, when there's, when, where's your position if you're not against the grain? Because you're supposed to be on the right side of history now. Well, look, this, this, this was from the very beginning when I first started reading Foucault in 1980, 79. And um, I went to see my feminist friends in England and they were very angry with me. They because, said, why are, you, wh why are you using Foucault? Because? Because Foucault is not a feminist. Okay. Right. The other thing that people have so asked wait, what me, did they, no, I want to hear what, well, did, what, well, what wasn't he a feminist, you well, know, what, what would have I, I never really, him? really understood why, I said, how can you possibly make an argument like that? Foucault Let's is... Let's say he doesn't write about women, right, as right. a category. Right, right. So he's a God, whole... he writes, he's looking at the force fields of power <laughs> in every single, through the body, through the flesh, through all of these other forms in which it's taking place where right. we, that we've set aside as if everything was relations of production and exchange in okay. social reproduction, which right. is where I, I came from, Marxist yeah. feminism of a particular kind. Okay. And people have asked me always, you know, how did you go from, I mean, how did you from Marx to Foucault? I mean, that's unbelievable. I said, actually, it's totally organic. Huh. There is so much for me. Both of them are looking at different forms of subsumption of the person, of the body, of language. And they look at subsumption and those relations of power in perhaps different ways, but they're looking very much at how we get subsumed by the systems in which we are. You talk about this in, in two yeah, of your books. Tell me what subsumption means then. In this, so in, subsumption in is a term that, that, that um, yeah, it's a term I really fell in love with. At the end of my dissertation, I was in a reading group, uh, part of a, a kind of equipe at the Collège de France with Maurice Godelier, a French um, Marxist anthropologist. And we were reading on what does it take to transit between two different systems of production. And one of the concepts that Marx used over and again was to understand how people could be absolutely or really subsumed. Are they only formally subsumed? That is, you don't change all the things that go on in their lives. Right. You just take that labor. Or are they fully subsumed okay. in which their whole lives are transformed. And I thought that just, that was colonialism. That was understanding huh. some of the major distinctions okay. between colonialisms that only formally extracted and, and colonialisms that transformed life world. Which then became later the idea of educating desire. That's right. Of actually shaping the, the supposedly most primal, most fundamental, most Absolutely. essential part of us. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. Okay. So that subsumption, so when people said when you went from Marx to Foucault, where does this take place in Foucault? Because it's... It takes place everywhere in Foucault. I mean, he is constantly looking at both the, 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 the curative and coercive forms in which we participate in our own positioning, right? I mean, we are subjugated and we are subjects and we are hmm. persons that are, are beholden. We, he, he just, he provides a whole, I think, a whole landscape of... Um, he's interested in the past for a really good reason because of the way in which it lives in the present. I mean, the history of the present isn't that everything is just, you know, mimetic and pulled over to what's going on now. But there's no way in which we can understand what our beautiful term, our historical ontology is, what our ontologies are, without putting that word historical in front of it. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's what Foucault did. Mm -hmm. Everyone used the term ontology or epistemology. What Foucault did, Annie and Hacking picked up on mm -hmm. so beautifully mm -hmm. in his work and gave that title 
to his own work, mm -hmm. historical ontology, mm -hmm. was to pick up when Foucault said, that's what I'm trying to do. It's an, an historical ontology of ourselves. He's really asking the Kantian question. What is our present? How do, how, how do we inhabit it? How do we come to inhabit it? And what are those conditions of possibility? And, that he's, have, and he's asking not who are we, but he said there is no we yet. That's right. How are we that's constituted right. over and over? Right. And it's not, as you said, both curative and coercive. I like yeah. that. Both we're made, totally. and we're made as self-creation and we're made by something else. Yeah. I want to go back to the 1980s moment with the feminists in London. <laughs> so, I so, shouldn't say that. Be no, it's totally, it's, it's, I think yeah. it's really critically useful it was, because it was it's, a a huge, it's a useful engagement. And mm. you could say, didn't Simone de Beauvoir already write in 1948 or 49, mm. you know, woman is not born but made? Absolutely. So isn't that a kind of critical yeah. ontology? <laughs> you know? Well, I think there was a really strong commitment at that particular moment. And, and, and with all due respect, this was a moment in which we were looking at the wages for housework debate that came out of the 1960s, really in the public domain. This wasn't just academics. People were on the right. streets. Right. And that the work that women were doing was unpaid labor, and it was crucial to the social reproduction of capitalism. Mm -hmm. In every way, and everything that's going on right now in feminist studies, they've almost reinvented the wheel. Mm. They're looking at the way in which either the emotional economy is part of the reproduction of capital or the ways in which women's labor at home, even when they're going to the factory, is crucial but mm. not paid for. I mean, mm. that is a theme that's been so resonant. And that was a moment in which we kind of set it out mm -hmm. on paper, mm -hmm. um, really making a, a Marxism that was a feminist Marxism right. that really said, this is how it's happening. And the only way that guy is getting to the factory is if that woman does what she's doing at home. Right, right, right. So mm -hmm. there was a, we felt very politically, and that's, that, you know. that's a worthy and But I think that if I, may, if I may say, I mean, this kind of leads me to a really, another place where people have often chided is, um, you know, Foucault's not political. Mm -hmm. right. And that's so, that's always helped, been so bizarre to me, to this day. I think some of the most interesting political, if they're interesting at all, I mean, about ourselves, the important political interventions of any kind I've made, I've made are understanding the kinds of critique that Foucault, how to critique, what critique is, that it's not about negativity, what goes into the literally the conceptual labor mm -hmm. of working to another space where it becomes possible to think of history and our present differently than we've been able to do. Right. Um, and so for me, Foucault's always been very yeah, political, yeah, right. really political. Um, well, I think that's his project, as you just said, to find a space to think about that the institutions and conditions in and through and under which we live have been constituted. Yeah. And what other political question is there, really? Because and if you don't, right. and if you don't understand that they have been constituted in the first place, that they're not organic, God-given, natural, you open them up for critique. And and not only have they been constituted in the passé composé, in that in that sense of they've constituted and that's how they are, they are constantly mm. in in mm. movement, constantly mm. in in renegotiation. And your job as someone committed to an interpretive analytics, as Paul Ravenel would put it is to be so on the qui vive, so alert to the minor, minor transgressions of what something was supposed to be at mm -hmm. one moment mm -hmm. and was no longer. So the whole book on Along the Archival Brain is in a way about this insecurity about who is white, how are we going to measure it? Do we, are we sure that we even know that's the way to do it. What, what are the consequences of doing it in this way? One of the things that Foucault politically has, has made me feel in terms of my own sort of pedagogy is, is where he says we should be, and he doesn't put out a lot of normatives, but something about an ethics of discomfort. That some level of discomfort, when you get comfortable, and this is Nietzsche, too, when he says, you know, you're wallowing and, you know, chewing the cud, right, yeah. of history. Right. What is it, the work that it does and it continues to do? And what does it mean to abide by an ethics of discomfort? What happens when you've 
sort of ingested the party line of everything is whiteness or everything is about intersectionality or everything is about X right. or everything is about colonial studies. Who cares, right? right. What, what, what's... Well, there's a moral satisfaction probably to be part of a movement, to think you're on the right side of things, to have decided sure. already, right? And so Foucault says the problem with that is mm. it's too static or it's... Mm. What you said, what did, you, what did Ravenous... Well, there's no critique left. Yeah. There's no critique once it's standing still. There's no critique that becomes possible any longer once it's, it, 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 it's, it's enclosed in that form. Right. I mean, I think that... For me, the excitement of genealogy is that it constantly is producing not only just its surplus, but all these trajectories that are not actually realized. So genealogy, it's not just another way. Everyone loves to use the term genealogy now. It's a genealogy of sex. It's a genealogy of the prisons. It's a genealogy. But actually, he was doing something very specific with genealogy. He was saying, genealogies are following paths that are actually not realized, that are suspended. Mm -hmm. Experiments that failed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, utopias that didn't actually mm -hmm, happen, mm -hmm. that were imagined. Hmm. And I find that an extraordinary hmm. thing to work with. So these are the kind of... Do you, Loose ends in yes, history, or they're, they're not foregone conclusions, but there Absolutely. could be many different options. They're full of preserved possibilities. They're full of, which is a term of Lawrence Hirschfeld, possibilities of what might have been. They, they move you away from originary stories. They move you away from teleology. They move you away from it had to, from causalities that had to be that and, way. And it constantly. makes the present not a foregone conclusion and inevitable. Totally. So we could have lived in a different present. Totally. So actually, I, That's I what think, genealogy is. I think is yesterday is the 30 year anniversary of Tiananmen Square, the uprising. Yeah. And so yeah. I teach the image, the tank man photograph a lot. Right. And I teach it to my students and I teach civil rights history before that where we right. know what the right side of history is. And I said, what's the right side of history here? Right. And I have a lot of Chinese national students right. and American students and students from right. Taiwan and different countries. Right. And I say, what is the outcome of this event? Right. Is it good or bad? Right. And we open it up and I say, well, some people think this is good because it stabilized China and thank God and Deng Xiaoping was able to open it up and look at the right. kind of success story. And some people say it's a tragedy. It, it was beating down a student protest movement that would have improved the country. Right. Said, were these anarchists trying to disrupt society or were they the ones who would have improved it? And I said, we have so many different openings from these photographs that we don't know, and they're being controlled as stories. So in some ways, what you're saying, that hist hist history allows us to see the present as not the only outcome possible. Absolutely. So it gives you hope, in a way, in a really Absolutely. radical sense of hope, really but hope not sense. in a pre prescriptive... But also a sense of there are reserves of possibility that sit there for us. There are yeah. exemplary moments that either were aborted or failed, or only partially realized. I mean, the thing I'm looking at now, uh, the, the, uh, what I call the anti-colonial avant-garde, it's not that it was this huge success, but it was rich, rich. I mean, people like Ames Cesar were thinking about knowledge as poetic knowledge and poetic truth. There was a way in which art and politics absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely needed one another to even, you know, survive. But... Um, and is the connection between art and politics for Césaire because part of it is the imagination? Or yeah, part totally. of it is actually that's one of the, an, an, one of the key words it's for Césaire. fiction in a way, right? Because it's you have totally. to write another and story. That's right. That's right. And you have to be open always to that fiction. So when I did the book Imperial Debris, I wrote it off Derek Wolcott's poem, right? On when he says colonialism is the rot that remains when the men are gone. Right. I mean, that was better than 30 books on theory. But the rod that remains, and you talked about this, it's very real. Yeah, it's you said very it's not a real. metaphor, right? You actually say that it's not just it's a metaphor. Not ju it's a metaphor, yeah, but, but it's, it's not, not just, just a, a metaphor. metaphor right? It's a motivated it's, it's, metaphor. It's literally yeah. doing all of this enormous yeah. work. It's doing yeah. creative work, imaginative work, political work, grounded, empirical, leads you in a particular kind of Tell place. me the quote again, the Walcott quote. The, um, the rot that remains when... Colonialism is the rot that remains when the men are gone. Hmm. And this notion of rot, for me, 
I mean, it was just, it just, it produced a whole project, a huge project mm -hmm. around this sort of acidity that eats away, right? Whether it be Agent Orange, three generations mm -hmm. later, mm -hmm. right? Or the environmental disasters mm -hmm. of palm oil production. Mm -hmm. That you can't just stop a history. It's colonialism is over because sovereignty has been okay, transferred. Okay, okay. It's about forgetting those okay. transfers of sovereignty. It's forgetting the formalities of the political and understanding the political at a totally other register that it endures in all of these spaces and all these forms. And I just, I feel. To connect it back to education of desire, the yeah. rod that remains. So colonialism is over when the French, the British, the Dutch, they leave. Right. Goodbye, they leave their country, you're now free not. and independent. Mm. The mindset of what people were, as you call it, educated to be invested in, to think of themselves as those subjects, oh, that yeah. doesn't go away that morning no, when doesn't. the people have it left, doesn't. right? That's right. So the rot is also... Of what it, one's, one imagines one's desires to be and, and yeah. how committed one remains to them and how you see them. I mean, that was all what they were trying to understand so much of the own yeah, yeah, yeah. anti-colonial intellectuals right. in so many different places. How much they were just invested in that which they didn't want to be invested in. And Foucault gives us a way to think, it's not just you step out of it. He said, he said earlier, he said it's constitutive and coercive, or curative and coercive. Right. It's both. Right. It I think he allows us to say not just well, colonial Fanon power. Well, Fanon does it too. Fanon asks it too. He says, do I desire this white woman? You know? Right. Like, Right. Um, it's well, Fanon comes out of the same kind of thinking to say it's it's yeah. not there's a subject and things are done to the subject, yeah. Yeah. or there's desire which mm -hmm. is authentic and natural. There's another thing that I feel that I mean another thing of the millions <laughs> of things I feel like I haven't even touched the surface um, of what Foucault did for me um, to understand an event. He has mm -hmm. a gorgeous definition of an event that literally was my conceptual methodology mm -hmm. for the entire book on the archive. And he defines an event as the breach of self-evidence. Okay. The breach of what just yesterday you took to be common sense. The breach, the break, the slit, the cut, right? In that moment, when that which seemed natural is denaturalized and that not need not be a war that need not be that which ends up as the events of the grand the revolution that's right <laughs> the but revolution. it's the moment in which there is a, a suspicion that the grounds on which we've been casting this are really fragile and it's a search in the archive for those moments of fragility. So each of the chapters for me that I was, was a moment of fragility. What Roland Barthes would call that punctum, that right, moment. Right, right, right. When you go like that, you go, wait a minute, why is that there, right? But he, again, what I said earlier, you have to have an eye and ear for it. Well, because that's actually, partly no. because social science has turned us off to well, our whole sensory regimes. I mean, well, I think that's- Let's say, what? not to be too broad, but. You know, academia in a way trains you to read right. according to paradigms. That's right. And then, as we know, totally. you will overread this because you'll say, I can't build anything on this weird thing here. This right. is a weird incident recorded. I don't know right. what to make sense of right. it. But and it's we, not representative. But as we said earlier, it doesn't do to say, oh, here I found the proof that I can now go against the grain. Because Foucault would say, no, they are co-constitutive. It's not that this That's one right. allows you to unravel all the other no. paradigms. No, exactly. So it's not, th and now we move in a kind of Thomas Kuhnian sense to a new paradigm. You're saying it stays there. Right. So what do you do with this? It's a low-level event. It's not the dramatic war or revolution. What do you do? What do you, how do you activate that then? When you find something like this, I mean, there must be, first of all, a moment of kind of um, strange sort of take your breath away discovery. It does. But it's it, not it positive is. necessarily, right? You think no, <laughs> but there's something about being very close to, I don't like to use the word bodies, but of something that doesn't imagine itself as political 
actually reverberating through okay. how people are moving and what they're saying and what they're questioning at times in which you imagine these are not people who would be questioning that thing. Mm -hmm. How could these people be saying that at this time? That was one mm -hmm. of the big questions Foucault always asked. Why this sentence now mm -hmm. at that moment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I took that very seriously. Why were they worrying about, in 1848, whether a ship was bringing the revolution from Paris or whether a mother who had to be away from her child for 20 years was the real cause of a demonstration? Was the demonstration because of the mail boat coming in from Europe? Or was the demonstration because women were going mad, mothers were going mad? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm in having to educate their kids to be white and European by sending them 14 years back to Amsterdam. Okay. So that's, that chapter yeah. is called Habits of a Colonial Heart. It's habituating how a colonial heart should operate and what it is to be a mother and what it is to be a child who for 14 years ends up on the dock and says, which of these women is my mother? Hmm. And for me, that is, that politics of emotion, that pathos is not the obverse of something about reason and rationality, but actually is what figures the rationalities that are part of the state. They are concerned with those issues. They are asking that question. They put a whole set of military around the city <laughs> of Batavia to make sure everything's okay. So for me, these, these small spaces actually condense in a very interesting way because they're so unselfconscious, right? right? They right, condense right, 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 right. so much. And it's not microhistory. It's not just the little shoemaker. Martin Guerre, it's not that. It's not Martin Guerre. I know, I love which we, the, Which is important, which is the Look, Natalie of, Davis is worth fiction in the archives. is brilliant, but it wasn't the Martin Guerre book that was brilliant. It was fiction in the archives. Okay. She understand, understood there was no archive that was not crafted as a fiction. Crafted as a fiction, as a story. That's right. And fiction and, here uh, meaning not and made fiction, up silliness, but no, powerful, powerful, powerful crafting, that we invested in. Per persuasive and... And that was her most amazing book. I mean, yeah. that book just. And tell me, what's the difference between what you're doing and why not microhistory? Where's the difference here to just get a little bit more specific for a non-historian? <laughs> the microhistory sort of stays within its little space, it stays within, within just is supposed to be almost homebound within its locality. Mm -hmm. The kind of history that energizes and excites me is one that transgresses so many different kinds of scales. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is a history that is the ones that I've been looking at, are ones that are literally part of mother's milk and part of the authority of the state. They're yeah, part right. of a mother being right. said to go mad at home and not being able to leave the house, and a government that mobilizes its soldiers because the colonized may pick up on what's going on in Batavia. And what you're saying is they're not, it's not hierarchies, there's that's power right. here and passion, Absolutely right. instinct here. He said there, and that's what Foucault teaches us. He said, this could be as powerful. This, this. He said, it's not we can decide, oh, here's oh, state power, sold. and here's women right. being upset that their children have been sent away. You're saying that's right. they are related. And that's actually really when he says that's what he's taught me. the way we organize what knowledge is, the way we organize what the truth is, the way power, these are not powers up here, truth is up there, other things are below. He said, what's interesting how they're related to one another and to, unpack, to open that up rather than to already have classified, say, well, you're dealing with This is the micro side the of, the, uh, of right. the big story. Right. No, that is okay. the big yeah. story. Yeah. That articulation. Okay. Okay is the story. So the book I did called Haunted by Empire, which was with a, a, a range of, um, of about, I guess it was about 12 American historians to look at the way intimacy actually shaped American empire. And when I asked various of these people, they said, I don't work on intimacy, intimacy and I don't work on empire and I don't think I can do it, Anne. So what were they working on? <laughs> 
<laughs> the actually, histories of how the colonies were organized. Or I mean, <laughs> how did they think of their own work? If they, you ask them a question and you sort of say, you're a historian. Some of them were doing feminist history. But you're historians, they're people in history, right. and they say, we don't deal with intimacy. And you're saying, well... Actually, more often they said, we don't deal with empire. Okay. <laughs> I mean, empire is not part of the story. Because America is the exception. It's not an empire. Or it's, or it's not my stuff. Okay. It's not well, what I do. Of, yeah. And so instead of doing what Foucault might, to understand the kinds of regimes of truth and the grids mm -hmm. of intelligibility that place those outside of the realm mm -hmm. of the U.S., he would ask us to do an archaeology. And I don't care about archaeology yeah, or genealogy. Right, right. I know that various people have made huge distinctions yeah, between yeah, the right. two. I think they're both really rich and they both operate together. But he would, he would actually have us do the landscape of how that gets distributed. How those, what gets foreclosed in the way in which US history is shaped, okay. rather than that's, that's thing, not right. my thing. How does it become easy to say, that's not my thing. I don't do that as an historian. I do American history. I don't do but the But you're asking questions which are so deep in people's identities, which That's I find right. interesting, intellectual That's and personal identities. Right. And true. you actually think there should just be sort of institutional demarcation that any That's sort right. of self-respecting right. intellectual would say, I don't even care. That's an interesting question. Let me think about it. And they probably feel, I don't have the mastery. I'm not competent. And you're saying, That's right. you're participating in having your knowledge already organized for That's you right. and you're never thinking about it. That's right. So they say, no, 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 that's how I do my work. It's, you know, America till 19, 1860 or whatever it is. You're saying that formation in itself... Is already so constrained, so utterly, utterly constrained. But even the ways in which American history, somebody like George Fredrickson, very well known for his book on white supremacy in South Africa and the U.S. So what he did is he already decided that these were two separate entities, mm -hmm. historically, and that he would compare them. So I went to the Carnegie Commission archives at Columbia to look at the ways in which the Carnegie Commission was a commission on poor whites in South Africa, to look at the way in which U.S. scientists were involved in, rather than this be an issue of comparison, it was of convergence, the ways in which U.S. scientists from Kentucky, from elsewhere, were involved in the proto-apartheid um, okay. work in South Africa. What is so hard to penser autrement? How do you use provisionally the categories that are there and make them part of the subject of inquiry rather than your baseline for move, moving forward? So one of the things I've done a lot of work on is what I call the politics of comparison. Not comparison, yeah, yeah, yeah. but actually when is comparison seen as viable? What kinds of comparison? What is the sort of philosophical kind of frame in which the question even becomes plausible to ask in that way? What have you already had to accept to make that comparison? Or to say it's not a comparison and it's incommensurable. One, what kind of analytic already f right. frames right, right, the right. entire thing? And that was something that was done among empires themselves. Which ones you could be compared to which? But that's interesting you're saying that the incommensurability is something people should know rather than saying, well, I don't want to look at it. Right. And, that, like, and Foucault taught us to say, well, the fact that it's incommensurate it's okay. tells you something. Exactly. And exactly. maybe also you bought into an incommensurability right. argument, which was wrong. Or you can say comparisons, which many comparisons work and say these are different things. You find difference all the time. Right. I mean, there's a, they, were, they used to be, as we know, we lived through two decades of celebrate difference, right. right? Right. And Foucault was the theorist of difference. But he would say, no, by locating difference, you haven't mastered this. You may have actually just... So I think what you're, what you're saying, which, which, which intrigues me and, and, and keeps me going, is how do you get to a place where you can ask a really formative question? Because that's what Foucault does. He says, no, that's not the question. But How I like what you're saying, it? without then settling and saying, but no, I've, no, I figured it out. Right. So you're right. saying, well, that's no. productive. You can move forward from here, and you don't have right. to sort of say, now I, mass, now I know between South Africa and America and North no. America. 
now I know. No, now it's just I have an opening. Stable it's all an opening. It's yeah. all an invitation. It also would mean you have to actually take stock of who you are in the archive. That's or absolutely in, true. Right at some moment, which yeah, is actually quite interesting yeah. about Foucault because. There because he he he, he a, shies from it and does it. There's a nice oh. interview where someone says, "What say something about your personal life?" He said, yes. "I've talked about nothing but my personal That's life." Right. He said, "This is who I am." It's actually That's quite right. charming in a way. He says, "It is. He's amazing." It's how we constitute ourselves as subjects. What else have we been doing my whole life? What do you want to know? And what does he return to in 1983, 84, right before he dies? He returns only to the constitution of the self, the right. constitution soir, right. the care of the self. Yeah. Yeah. Of how much, but what um, Bernard Harcourt did this 13, 13 readings of all the lectures right. of Foucault's. Well, no one probably had ever read the lectures oh. in, from 1970 to 84 because they were printed out of line. Okay. So 1976, oh, so. the year that I started right. with the Fonds de la Société, Society Must Be Defended. Right was the first one. Right. And then we, we skipped around over the years. Oh, and the last one was 1970, this extraordinary lesson sur la volonté de savoir, which is funny because it's the volonté de savoir, which is, the, which is what he called the history of sexuality, but this is right. 10 years before <laughs> well, that. I mean, the, everything is so whacked out. He's constantly returning. This is an extraordinary but this volume is actually that a no book, one This is actually a book to say, to know yourself. And in some ways he's very, critical of the Socratic idea, know thyself, but yeah. Well, he's very critical of that, but, but the But critical care. in a way to say, what yeah. does it do for us? That's not right. critical in a dismissive sense, no, it's a silly sense. What does this yeah. do to yeah. the imperative to know yourself? Yeah. What are you supposed to discover? Yeah. So I think that you're right, you're saying he starts then and he comes back. He comes again back and again. again and again. In the most, and, we, and, and I was just floored, and many of us were, reading from 1970 to 1984, mm. the, the, the words, the lexicon was already there and he's pulling it forward again. But there's something very, very interesting in this first volume that I've been doing work on. It's very hard to find and talk to lots of people about this, where Foucault stands on sentiment. <laughs> he told us very clearly in the genealogy piece on Nietzsche that every history Every sentiment has a history, but he never did it himself. And this, this <laughs> volume, this first volume, is actually about curiosity, about sensation, mm -hmm. about sensibility, mm -hmm. about volonté. What is volonté? Is that an affect? Mm -hmm. Is, is, is mm -hmm. that will, a desire that he says is at, actually at the heart of who we are? Mm -hmm. So it's something I'm writing. I've been yeah, writing it for several years, thinking it through. So what would it do to look at a kind of analytic morphology, an affective morphology, chez Foucault? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What would it do to see where does affect, because clearly the interviews on homosexuality, he says, you know, it's, it's friendship. It's not about sex. Right. He says it's, it's, it's about a... <laughs> yes, it's very famous. He says very, very famous. famous. He said, Sex, it's so boring. It's so boring. But all the other things are so fascinating. Exactly. And you sort of, and that, that's actually kind of charming in a way. He's because always charming. He's very, char he's very charming. And there's something, I think the charm is it opens up a it's, vulnerability to himself to say, I actually think about these things for me and for, my, for everyone. It's not an analytic project. I'm an academic. I'm a philosopher to teach you something. I'm trying to encourage you to think about what does it mean for you to take an interest in yourself? That may be something you've been taught. And I think it's very related to his notion that if I knew what I was going to write beforehand, I then I never would have written it, right? And I think that is part of this. What do you end up learning? And where do you, how humbled right. do you become? Yeah. I mean, each time I've written another book on empire, I think I don't understand it anymore or I haven't understood it no. enough, I mean, or it, I don't, I need to start again from another place. Actually, right? the, I think Madness and Civilization, I believe, ends with, there's a, he says, there's the poet Hölderlin who goes mad, very right. famously, a German romantic poet, so 1805, right. he loses his mind and then writes many, many, many more poems, which right. people then read. Heidegger thinks he's the greatest poet since right. the Greeks. Right. And then Foucault says, but this, 
opens up a question. It is not an answer that poetry ends in madness. And you think, wait, you just had the whole book. This is no, and he said, this is when we should begin to think. And so the book ends with opening up. He say, why does poetry touch on madness? And what does it mean for the figure of poetry in the West to become mad? And he says, this mm. is where you have to start thinking. And, I, and I've taught this book, and it's very strange mm. to teach because you kind of want to think, okay, and then madness ends up here. And he right. says, the, the really fine line between what I called the imagination earlier and right. madness, between so fiction sorry. and fantasy, all these things, which he says, this is where we really want to locate all this. So he, he does, I wish I had brought the book with me. It's one of the lectures, and I'm not sure it's the bio politics lecture, but he has this um, parenthesis on truth in which he takes out for about five pages talking about very specific sorts of things. Then all of a sudden he stops. He said, let's talk about truth for a moment and what reality is, about the fact that the fictions that we shape and live with are actually the real and that we can't just substitute and say, no, the fiction is real and the real is fiction. That literally they're constantly working through each other. And then he goes on with the book. And he leaves you in this, this other place, right? Mm -hmm, and, and sort of mm -hmm. accounting for madness and civilization mm -hmm, in some mm -hmm, mm -hmm. way. I mean, Ian Hacking said the most important word in madness and civilization that I've actually written about is not reason, but des raisons, yeah. without being able to understand what that actually is. Unreason, right, which, remember, is, which disappears in the English translation. That's exactly like, right. Folie des raisons exactly. in French, and then in, exactly. in English, it's um, madness and civilization, exactly. which is really and, different. And totally different. Like, and actually this, this space of like des, un... ra des raisons, this, this underside of reason, right. this piece of part of almost like a um, aligning to yeah. reason yeah. in some sense. Um, I mean, I think that's what's so amazing that Foucault doesn't ever stay still. With but that's actually a good way to say it. doesn't say madness and reason, which is its opposite. He said, right. because he says somewhere right. else, rationalist discourse, rational politics right. can't be countered with reason. Right. And right. unreason can't that's be right. countered with reasons. That's unreason right. meaning irrational. Right. You have to find something else. Mm -hmm. So unreason may be a way to unthink this opposition that there's... I think it holds something very strong yeah. there and has not been. I mean, I went to the lecture when, when Ian you know, gave it to Columbia and I went, oh my God, that's where I am. That's where I've been. That's where, you know, that's the, the amazing thing I think about thinking with people who you just get so much from over and over again is you already recognize it in yourself. And it's not to say you're fully yourself and you're brilliant or anything like that. Right, right, right. It's something that you already know. When I first read the history of sexuality, I already knew it. And I don't mean I knew I it like you I am so yeah. great. I mean, there was some place in the way in which I was reading the archives in which he articulated something that I already knew about this unbelievable riso. He says that the positive is not a mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's a network right. of things that come together and congeal together. And when labor and sexuality and women's wages and plantation systems congeal in a certain way, something happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he teaches you, that's why I was thinking of him as, it's a conceptual methodology mm -hmm. that he's after. Mm -hmm. It's constantly. Mm -hmm. and and concept work is a term he uses. Yeah, yeah. Again, I, I didn't know he used it. And I, I thought I had used it. And I thought, well, Paul Rabinow uses it. And so it's, it's there. Everybody's using it. But um, it's, it's done so much work for me. I think of conceptual labor. But I love about your work that actually, what I think is what you said you found in his work, what you already kind of knew or intuited. But you've used his work to do new work. And over I also and think this whole idea to me of a Foucauldian is about as meaningful as being, I don't know, from the West Village. I mean, it means really <laughs> that much to me. So, but for you yeah. saying Foucauldian means to keep on opening up That's these right. questions and adding it and saying, this allows me to think, which I think is actually, th th this, That's for right. me, that part is very so, much deeply philosophical. So, so I think if, if one asks me, 
to you know really give a sentence on why is it Foucault? It, it's it's the style of thought. It's the style. Yeah, yeah. interesting, right? Yeah, it's not just the style of writing. Mm. It's not only the style of rewriting history in another way. It's a kind of style of thought and a pacing. Mm -hmm. It's the pacing. Sometimes you find it's almost excruciating. He says the same thing again and again. But he's doing the work in restating it. Mm -hmm. If you watch really carefully, you think, oh my God, why is he repeating this again? But it's not just a repeat. He's thinking it he literally inside. And that's why I like, I like the lectures so much more than any of the books. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I get tired of the books. Not tired of them in the yeah, sense of I don't though. want them, but something happens in the lectures. Yeah. And also something happens in some of the interviews that is oh, yeah. really otherwise, right? I mean, I mean to me, this has been an, in, the interviews, there's a part yeah. in the interview where he talks about the difference between a conversation and a polemic. And he says, I'm mm. not a polemicist, I never no, engage, people That's provoke right. me. And he right. says, That's right. in a conversation, both, are deeply engaged in trying to find a truth. Mm. You're committed to your statements. You become more committed because the other person will challenge you or want evidence or ask you something. But the other person is never out to get you and to basically try to throw you out of the whole conversation, right. which is what polemics right. are. And he says, right. I'm not interested in polemics, but I'm very interested in what happens in conversation yeah. because both risk a lot, both people, to get to something and that's really they're yeah. mutually invested in. And he said, and I think the lectures have that too. He actually really wants to reach something yeah. that he couldn't have done on his own without this audience. Yeah. Or in the interviews, there's something more. Yeah, that I, think, I think that's really right. I think that's really yeah. right. And I think it's what leads him in some ways to the work on Paricia, on the notion right. of truth as fearless speech. That there, I mean, when I first started reading that, I went, whoa, that is exactly, what risk can I put myself at? And can I ever be at risk as an academic with tenure and a name position? Can, can an academic ever? Right. Or is there some way in which I can find a space that is really putting myself at risk in the agora? in a public sphere in a different kind of way than I have before. So I, 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 I really think, you know, returning to New York and teaching in Ramallah in Berset, and I teach in a maximum security prison, and doing something at MoMA two months ago, these are all on the edges for me right. of my comfort zone. But this They're is a all. great, this is a, I think but a great, that's... that you take from Parisia, this late work, which oh. is, only exists in some really strange, overpriced little book that I have. I it's know, for, well, it's, but it's in the lectures beautifully. Yeah, so I'm going to try to link and, it in there. Yeah. And so it's about political speech. It's, it was in Semiotex, way, way, yeah. Which genuinely risks something. It's got to risk something. Yeah. It's got to, so for, you know, Sophocles, it risks death. Yeah. Well. But, for, <laughs> but what, what, where could you go mm -hmm. in which you've, you've moved sort of to the edge of something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really hard, and I, I think it becomes harder and harder, you know, as you're, well, it's very hard when you're junior and you're trying to make sure you get tenure as an academic, and it's hard when you get all this, this accolades and stuff and you should really be out there on the edge. Well, we know right? for Socrates it was hard. Yeah. So it's always been hard. Yeah, There's always, always been, been real hard. danger. It's really There's been always hard. been real danger. Maybe it's not yeah. all bad that people know their real risks. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you for this conversation. Oh, That's I, great. I feel like we hardly touched That's, on well, all the amazing no, things, fantastic. but thank you. Thank you oh, so, much. so much. For this. Thank you.